All right, welcome. I am Dr. Anna Smith, and I would like to welcome you to the Creatively Critical Tech Research Design Practice Speaker Series. You can see on the screen some of our future speakers in this series. So I have some introductory remarks, um, and I would like to welcome you for joining, uh, and welcome to those of you joining our panel or as an audience. And I would like to uh, ask you to go ahead and introduce yourself while I do this um, in the chat. And we're keeping the chat open for the most dialogic experience possible. Um, and also please respect and keep your comments productive as you go ahead and use that chat feature. Uh, the Creatively Critical Tech series comes to us from the Education Now Lab at Illinois State University in the School of Teaching and Learning. The Education Now Lab is a community-engaged research practice lab that engages in and produces a range of critical, interdisciplinary, public, academic, and new media and emerging technology scholarship with and alongside community members as we work toward more um, just educational futures. We are hosting this series as part of a course called Critical Perspectives on Technology and Education, and we will be sharing our takeaways through social media throughout this semester um, at Education Now Lab on both Twitter and Instagram. Uh, you can use the hashtag um, EduNowLab, and I will put this in the chat here, um, or these tags to connect with us. There's some things in the, in the chat there. And you can also follow along with us in there. Uh, the last link I just added to the chat as well is um, to where you could register for future talks if you wanted to, to join. The series is co-sponsored by the Illinois State University Office of Research and Graduate Studies and the College of Education, and we thank them for their generous support. And in that, we recognize that we are, and we recognize and are working to make meaningful that Illinois State University is built on the land and waters of multiple indigenous nations who are forcibly removed, including the Illini, Peoria, and the Miami. And later, due to the colonial encroachment and displacement to the Fox, Potawatomi, Sauk, Shawnee, Winnebago, Iowa, Muscatin, Piankasha, Wea and Kickapoo nations. We also honor the indigenous people who we have excluded due to historical erasure and inaccuracy. Um, but I would, um, today we're pleased to join by Dr. Sava Saheli Singh, Leslie Marshall and Tim Mom. We are, uh, who are members of a team of researchers and creators who have written and produced the short film, Tres Dancing, hashtag Tres Dancing, as part of a film series called Screening Surveillance. And if you wanted to access that film for Screening Surveillance, here is the address there. Um, Dr. Sava Saheli Singh is assistant professor of digital futures with the faculty of education at York University. As an interdisciplinary scholar and filmmaker, Sava brings a feminist abolitionist lens to critically examining the convergence of education, technology, surveillance, speculative futures, and intersectional marginality. Leslie Marshall is a US Canadian intermedia artist currently working on independent AV projects with her company, um, Vaven Marshall, uh, audiovisual Network. An award-winning filmmaker with films appearing in 40 festivals national and internationally, music videos by Leslie Marshall have been featured on Rolling Stone, American Songwriter, Vice, Exclaim, to name a few. Leslie Marshall's cinematography and editing of the 2019 Inside Out selected web series Village Legacy Project can be seen on Out TV. Um, Tin Mon, um, is author and journalist using both fiction and nonfiction to explore issues around cities, class, culture, technology, and the future. His work has appeared on the BBC, New Scientist, MIT Technology Review, One Zero, and Vice Motherboard. His debut novel, Infinite Detail, was published by FSG in 2019 and selected by The Guardian as their science fiction and fantasy book of the year and shortlisted for the Locus Magazine Award for Best First Novel. We also want to welcome and thank our ASL interpreter tonight, Kelly Hobbegger. So tonight we'll be discussing the film, Trez Dancing, and its subject, surveillance technologies, um, in particular in education. 
as well as the film's creation and the use of film as scholarship and public scholarship. Um, uh, and then to get us started, we thought we would watch the first few minutes of the film, and then we'll begin with questions that our doctoral students have created last night. So warning, we're going to have some spoilers as we talk tonight. <laughs> so if you haven't watched the film, I highly recommend going watching the film and the other films in this series. Um, at any time in our discussion, feel, please feel free to add questions in the Q&A space or to raise them uh, in the chat, and you can also discuss in the chat. So with that said, let me... Move my screen and uh, let's go ahead and, and watch this first two minutes here of the film. And... Welcome to Cheat Shield. Please start by looking directly into the camera and stating your full name and date of birth. Francesca Williams, December 7th, 2012. Identity confirmed. Thank you, Francesca. Today, you will be taking Basic Math Literacy Assessment 101. In order to continue, please verbally confirm that you have read Cheat Shield's Code of Conduct and agreed to being observed and recorded. Failure to comply may result in automatic disqualification. I, yes, I confirm. Thank you. You have been allocated 45 minutes for this assessment, which will commence now. You are reminded that this assessment must be taken in a private, solitary space. Infringement locked. Mom, keep the damn dog quiet! Authorized movement detected. You are reminded that you must remain stationary for the duration of the assessment. Infringement locked. Yeah, but... Unauthorized vocal interaction detected. You are reminded that this assessment must be taken in a private, solitary space. Infringement locked. Oh, come on. Infringement limit you have now been disqualified from taking this assessment and will be locked out of the system. Please refer to your educational establishment's cheat shield administrator for next steps. Uh. All right, so I went back and forth and we should start with that because it was so stressful when, when we watched it <laughs> last night as a class. Um, uh, you could feel it's palpable. Uh, so maybe to get started, um, let's just start with the larger screening surveillance film series. How did this project come to be? Uh, why surveillance as a subject, film as a medium? Um, I'm trying to think of the whether to tell you the long version or the short version. But um, I was when I finished my PhD, which was um, focused on Twitter and academic Twitter. Um, I was very interested in the way that social media was used as a sur to surveil people. Um, at the time, I was thinking about academics and students and stuff like that. So when I finished that, I was very much interested in surveillance. And uh, Queen's University had a really great group of people um, at, the at the Surveillance Studies Center, which sadly um, has been shuttered, which makes me really sad. But um, they have been doing really interesting work around surveillance and the use of technology um, to surveil just everyday people. And they advertise a postdoctoral fellowship um, because they wanted to create some sort of educational material around surveillance because they wanted they had a huge corpus of over a decade's worth of research and they wanted to make that more accessible to a wider audience. Um, so I showed up and my background was in ed tech and they were like, what are you gonna make? And um, Tim, I kind of talked to him a lot about this and he was like, well, what? cause he's done similar stuff before. And he was like, would they be interested in movies? And I'm like, you know what, I'll ask them. Um, and so I did, and they were very interested in it because they had kind of done, um, they had created materials with um, 
vignettes that kind of told stories about people's experiences with with surveillance so this seemed like very natural kind of flow for them um and i i don't know why i pitched three not one not two but three short films on surveillance to them um and i applied for funding from the office of the privacy commissioner of canada um and they were very interested in it so i got i got funded by the government in 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 a sense to create um, three near future speculative fiction short films about the effect of surveillance. Um, and so that was kind of the whole project. And after that, I, when I moved to Ottawa to do a second postdoctoral fellowship, um, they kind of said, hey, would you like to make yet another one? And that's where I got to work with Leslie and, and make um, hashtag press dancing. So that's kind of like a, the short version of how the how the project came to be. So Leslie and, and Tim, so you, you came on in this, this particular film around um, surveillance and education. What, what drew you to this topic or this film and your interests there? Um, well, Sava came to me as a, as a production company because she was particularly interested in hiring. Well, it was kind of a, through our greater community of of like technicians and filmmakers that, that have found me, but uh, uh, because of my company is uh, like focused on equity and representation behind the camera in terms of our technicians and how we do casting and stuff, um, and that that's what attracted her because her project was um, starring people of color and 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 really wanting to tell their story and have them tell the story. So I didn't really, I, I love the project. I, I have a background in communication and media and I love technology and I'm attracted to stories of STEM. And, um, but uh, it, it was basically um, Sava's uh, ideology and like her commitment to her ethics uh, that kind of brought her to my production company specifically. Yeah, that's great. Uh, yeah. Um, so we should, I, I think for, uh, for uh, openness reasons, we should point out that me and Sabra are married. <laughs> we are, I, yeah. we, I know they know each other. They knew each other before. Yeah, it's he's nepotism. Sitting, he's sitting next door. Um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm in the next door room. Um, uh, and I had written, uh, like Sabra said, I've written, I've, I've written a bunch of these short speculative movies for different people about these kind of issues. I think I've, I think I've done like eight or something now. Um, and I wrote one of the first round of uh, of the screening surveillance movies, one called Model Employee. And I wasn't meant to be writing this one. There's a, I won't go into any details, there was a slight <laughs> drama around the person that was meant to be writing and directing the movie originally, and it didn't kind of work out. Uh, and we were very late and we were running short of time. <laughs> and um, we had to come up with a completely new idea because we couldn't use their idea either. Um, so I had to kind of, kind of come up with an idea me and Sabah sat down and, and chatted about it a bit and um, I was very interested in like TikTok and, and stuff like that was kind of first kind of getting popular over here uh, a couple of years ago when we were we were working on this so that that kind of came to me um, it was interesting because I'd wanted to do something about education for a while and it's kind of it's a weird topic actually education um, from my point of view if I ever approach I wanted to write about ed tech in non-fiction places like the BBC and Vice and stuff. And I was always like, editors weren't very interested. They didn't think it was particularly like a topic that people would be interested in before COVID. And then after COVID, it completely changed. Like ed tech <laughs> was suddenly this massive issue. And, I, you know, I, I was I was suddenly doing a load of speculative products, projects for clients around, you know, everything from, uh uh cheat surveillance to virtual reality and stuff like this so um it was nice it was nice to be able to work on that i think having you know obviously like known Sava's work for for like the last de decade it was it was it felt really good to be kind of doing something that was kind of based around that i want to add i think like i, I didn't answer the last question on your <clears throat> many part question which is like why film and i think one of the reasons um, we chose to film and then also to do short film is because it's a really great way to 
communicate certain aspects and certain like storytelling and narrative is a really great way to get people to pay attention to things um and doing something that's like near future near near future fiction which is just like it kind of looks like where we are now but slightly different gets people to really connect with what's going on so like the films you watch they are kind of futuristic but they also speak to now right and you like everyone can relate to what's happening in them um and film especially we always have opinions, right? We're always like, everyone's arguing on the internet about various things that they're thinking. So film has always been something that gets people talking, thinking, interacting with each other. Um, and to use this to talk especially about technology and about surveillance and about how it kind of pervades our lives and invades our lives, I think it's a very good and, and, and effective way and compelling way to get people to think about these things. And creating a short film is good, right? Because everyone has short attention spans nowadays. So it's like, it's like when I tell people I made a film, they're like, oh, and I'm like, it's, it's less than 15 minutes. You'll be able to watch it. And they're like, oh, okay. And then it gets them to watch it more. So I've had that conversation so often. So I think, you know, being able to do that in this way and then making them free for people to use in their classrooms. Um, that was kind of part of the project, right? We wanted to create an educational resource for teachers and for other people who wanted to kind of use this as a way to start talking about the issues that these films represent. Uh, as a class, we watched this last night um, and we had the chat going on um, and anyone can chime in if you want from the class. Uh, but we were remarking how palpable it was. So as you're talking about the film and being able to express those, all those things. And I also, we were also talking about the number of threads of different um, aspects of technologies in education. So there was a thread around youth culture, right? TikTok um, trends that way. Um, the intertwining of policing and education was what came through the gamification of learning for corporate gain came through so clearly. Um, and um, and in a way that, yeah, if we were writing one article or if we were writing a you know a letter to the editor or something else, I'm not sure you could tie you could thread so many plots, if that makes sense, or so many discourses together in quite the same way. That's something that stood out to me at least. Not really a question, but I <laughs> I hear you on film. Um, I haven't tried it myself as a, as a medium to um, to tell stories or anything, but uh, but I could feel that in the in the film. We it, a film also right. is such a yeah. one directional thing too. Like it's you have to sit, you have to watch it. <laughs> so it's like you have this captivated audience, and it's like if you're trying to tell mm -hmm. deliver a message, it's a nice way to do it. <laughs> Can't help myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and it's one that, that gathers a lot of our senses too, right? It, well, it's still just, it's one, yeah, it pulls us in multiple parts of us toward um, in one direction, yeah. So speaking of palpable, so we noted how Frankie was made desperate at multiple times um, as the systems enacted on her. And that was something that we were remarking on. Um, we're wondering about the research around those made vulnerable by such systems. Um, uh, and how often we are, when we're, we're made vulnerable like that, willing to do whatever is necessary, regardless of particular risks. Um, and then people are put in those positions uh, more often than others. So what, do, so what do we know about the impact of surveillance technologies on populations who are already multiply marginalized? And to what extent are the problems encountered by Frankie in this piece um, a function of data surveillance itself or this like mix of societal in inequalities, systems of discrimination, surveillance tech. Um, I guess both thinking about in the in the film and the way you're telling the story here and then also the research that we know that's out there on, on that. It, I think part of um, the so much research that talks about how marginalized communi uh, communities and marginalized individuals bear the brunt of, as you were saying, many threads of things coming together, right? So there's um, there's intersectionality in terms of someone's identity and how different intersections are impacted differently by the same technology. And so, you know, young women of color, you know, where do they live? Um, what is happening in their lives? And I think the pandemic, 
the early days of the pandemic really, like Tim was saying, really made that stark, right? Like who's at home, who gets to be at home, who's being surveilled while that's happening, what's happening in the background. I think all of those points that are in the narrative really resonated with people because we saw not just research about that, but mainstream media was talking about it too, right? Suddenly, like Tim said, ed tech became the thing, became the conversation because everyone's kids were suddenly like, what are we doing with this? Um, and so like, We've had a lot of research that's been talking about it, you know, like um, Safiya Noble's algorithms of oppression, even Simone Brown talking about like, you know, how surveillance, like the roots of surveillance are like just embedded in like racism and um, slavery in America and stuff like that. So it's like all those things we've been shouting about them. And then the pandemic in some ways made them made them bear in a way that was really hard to ignore. I mean, I won't go into talking about how I really wish that we, because all these things were now visible, that we would have made good choices and made good changes. And we seem to have lurched the other way, but that's a different conversation. But um, very much just like, you know, highlighting all the different ways in which who people are can get impacted by this stuff. And and it's it's important, like it a lot of things display unique situations and 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 press dancing and the other films very much want to talk about everyday life right every all the characters in these films could be someone we know um and so we wanted to really just make it it's like it's mundane in many ways right that's what a lot of the surveillance is it's very mundane we're sitting here right now talking to each other using zoom we are being surveilled in some ways right like what is what is our data happening what it's become very just in the background right uh, like surveillance has become a part of our infrastructure in ways that are just terrifying and so we wanted to kind of like highlight that as well um yeah one of the things i was very keen to uh like highlight in the script and make a focus of the script was um the idea of choice and and like that that frankie doesn't really have any choice you mentioned anna that there's like moments of desperation and i'm glad that came through because i really that was really important to me um, one thing the tech industry really likes to do, and um, particularly it feels like this, the kind of startups that are building some of this software, some of this, this ed tech infrastructure is prevent a thing as a choice. So there's this, this marketplace of choices and there's this marketplaces, marketplace of, of ideas or marketplace of, of different ways of, of solving problems using, using technology. And you know, it's just not really the case, right? You have a, you, you have a, someone has a choice over which systems to use, arguably, um, but it's not students using them, it's not teachers using them, um, but it's still presented to everybody as 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 your choice. And and right, you know, right at the beginning of the film, um, right near the beginning of the film, just after the, the kind of the the scene you showed, uh, Frankie's given the choice about whether she wants to to use this technology, but the option is for her to reset, re reset a whole year of school. That's a choice. Right? And it's not really a choice because no student's <laughs> really going to want to do that. If there's a, a, a quicker tech fueled out option, then they're going to take that. Um, so that, yeah, that was a really important thing. I think I, I kind of, I kind of wanted to stress. We had lots of, question th thoughts about your intentional choices um <laughs> uh from you know the choice of characters and actors and um and the positionings but then also um around the locations of the film uh we notice this almost um juxtaposition of indoor outdoor as well so at the screen um was, was talking to school personnel right and most of the activities that when the glasses came off um, uh, were with with friends and it was out, outdoors. Um, we also noticed that there there weren't as many math problems <laughs> given to Frankie. If you haven't watched the film, you'll have to watch the film outdoors, um, but there were like, more, more it seemed like indoors. Um, so we were wondering about that as a, as a choice, the choice of locations um, and place the role of, of it, what, the, what your thoughts were about and the settings um, within the film. Is that something that you baked in, uh, Tim, when you were writing it, or? Like, yes and no, that's making me sound super, super smart. 
<laughs> there's a certain element to I did want to like yeah have a difference between uh Frankie and her friends and not wearing glasses and 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 the stuff that's happening when she is wearing the glasses um and I think Hingman the director and, and you Leslie made a good, good like did that well just with cinematography really a lot of the time uh, it feels more claustrophobic when she's got the glasses on as opposed to when she's she's with her friends or or, or doing other stuff. Um, one of the things uh, I kind of pushed for in the production, we even changed the music at one point to kind of emphasize it, I think, was to to make to feel, make it feel quite frantic. So in moments of her it being quite calm when she's with her friends, but other times it's quite frantic. And that, again, it comes back to what I was saying earlier, that this idea of her lack of choices that she's been pushed into a situation. It's, no, it's not a film about her. Well, it's a film about her not having agency, right? And and that's kind of, I think that kind of governed a lot of the choices about how it's made. She doesn't have agency until the end, and then she's given a terrible choice to make at the end. No spoilers, but again, <laughs> to go back to that film, of not, they're not being real choices. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely used the interior exterior thing to make that point because that sounds really cool. <laughs> I'm gonna well, ask we've, Leslie a point within that. Yeah, I, I'm gonna <laughs> ask Leslie to say more about that because I think um yeah. and I want to give a shout out to Hingman Lung, who is our um director, and she was wonderful mm -hmm. and also Ottawa based. Um and she couldn't join us today because she's um dealing with stuff, unfortunately. But um I remember going uh location hunting with Leslie and Hingman and you know, looking for really great places outdoors that mm -hmm. that kind of, you know, were on the edge of like you know, because they were trust dancing, right? Like trespassing and dancing, and then um, the interiors were all yeah. like filmed inside my home. Yeah. <laughs> I don't live there anymore, so I'm, I'm I feel safe saying that. But say more about that, Leslie. Well, yeah, it's, it was an interesting time. We were filming in COVID. I mean, it's it's still COVID, but it was a different time in COVID. And so, as a production company, we're thinking about liability. We're thinking about how can we film in places that make sense for the kind of crew we have. Um, and then also, yes, walking this line of trespassing, <laughs> tr trespassing, trespassing and filming and, and what, where we would need a permit, where we wouldn't need a permit and, uh, and what aesthetically uh, fit the film. So there's the, the end scene uh, near the bridge. It's kind of a gray area in terms of auto. It's like near public path, but it is in front of a fence that has a big no trespassing sign. And, and we did some like coyness of like, we had them like touch no trespassing signs. We just walked by them. Um, but uh, yeah, it was uh, in, in any, making any film project, you have to really decide, uh, you know, you want the locations that look aesthetically the best, but then practically is, is kind of what you're, you're, you are left with. So it was, it was a, it was tough because we also were working with um, people who were under 18 and so had to go to school and working with their schedules and working with the sunlight and 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 so we and how many days we had to film it was it was interesting it was getting to all the locations and filming a lot outside it was also yeah yeah <laughs> it was also a tight budget because um for this one, I did not get funding um, from a funding body, but my, you know, my research um, uh, group at the University of Ottawa, they had some funding, and but we only had a very specific budget, right? And so there were only so many locations and so many places that we could go and do stuff. And, you know, working in the academy and trying to do that stuff and trying to get money and trying to work and try to pay people fairly is really hard like um i feel like you know everyone worked really really hard and leslie really just like stretched it as much as she could um but like you know it came together and i think we'll talk a little bit more i think later in terms of like collaboration collaborating outside of the academy and how to like you know do some of that well we can jump to that right now because that's what i was okay. thinking too okay. so talk about practicalities <laughs> leslie what what is it like to work with academics <laughs> um because it, it, and i'm imagining like producing films you know outside and then academia has its own games it plays <laughs> so yeah um, and those realities like how does that how did how was that as a filmmaker yeah it was i mean filmmaking is a 
is an interesting like business because so much of the funding for films are are brought together in in multiple ways so like you'll have some commercial funding you'll have grant funding you'll have private investors and then a lot of filmmakers are passion people and they put their own money to make the make their projects and so my company you know it's you come to me and i and i i'll come i'll try and make your film in whatever way that is possible and so for this it was working within the academic institutions and relying on the funding from them and so um i guess it's like understanding when um like payout deadlines are possible because we're also um, a community of artists and also we're like hiring people so we have to know like when are people gonna get paid so that when we're hiring people they know when they're gonna get paid and when when uh some people they can put the work up front and some people cannot so really trying to communicate that to the academic institutions is is not the most fun experience um and in the end it, it did go over budget and so we tried to barter in a sense of like what could we get in exchange for um the overtime that we're putting on this project is it like can i get a class in lieu can i get a tax receipt and in the end the university didn't really give us anything else um and they and it kind of felt like it was turning into like a red tape situation where like no one's really answering an email or no one's responsible to this email and they you know i feel like they did their best in terms of um helping with festival funding which was great um we've been able to bring it to a lot of interesting festivals um and sava and you know your institution here like a lot of academic institutions and festivals have been interested in terms of um the ed tech portion of it uh but yeah it was it's really it was interesting working with uh institution but honestly looking sava it's interesting doing this now because I, I i work with commercial productions where the money is up front usually with commercial productions it's it's already there but now i work with a lot of grant funding and it's it's very similar it's like you're waiting a long time sometimes for those checks and and that's difficult um when you're in an economy that can be so much paycheck to paycheck yeah just it was really i think it's really hard to kind of ride that line between wanting to, um, it was frustrating for me because I wanted to get people paid, but I wasn't like, as a postdoc, I was also not in a position of power within the institution. So it was just me being like, I just email this person, you know, it was a similar thing. And it, it feels frustrating because we all know how much for, how many forms you have to fill in to get a thing done at an institution. So it's, it was a lesson, I think, in terms of like, you know, I'm hoping to do more work like this in the future and like how to set up systems where we can pay people in a timely manner or, you know, do some of that work so that we're not putting the burden on the more precarious people that we're working with. Right. Mm -hmm. Because um, people who work on film are usually freelance actors and actresses, you know, they're always like going from job to job. And so it's important that they ha they get paid in a timely manner. And it's hard to ensure that from within the academy. So just to note to those of you who are trying to do this, try and figure out ways in which to do that um, if you are in a position of power within the academy. No, I think that's that's key. And we were thinking um, as a course, that thinking about alternative ways to both produce in more participatory ways and then also disseminate um, scholarship uh, that, like you said, it's, it often can be inaccessible. Um, and, and the screening surveillance is, I, I was glad that you, I, I hadn't thought of it as an accessibility issue um, when in terms of, you know, scholarship, getting it out there, research that is happening. We have, you said they had just banks of research on surveillance and let's make it more accessible. Um, so, so yeah, we were thinking about, or we were talking in this course and we've been thinking about how is it um, in, in terms of that kind of uh, creative scholarly endeavor um, and, and some of this practicality. So that's very helpful to hear about those realities, about the number of things that you have to manage. It's not just creating the narrative, right? Creating the film. It's all of the the whole structure around it um, that also has to be created. Um, how do you find the time to do that, the... Um, <laughs> right? The know-how to do that. Like, there's a lot more than 
been what it seems like just setting up this series, right? The number of emails we sent back and forth in the forms and the <laughs> everything that we that we were doing. And so where ha- where did you um how did you get experience in those things that you needed to do to put together a project like this um, and produce something like this? And yeah, what are some of the other behind the scenes things like that? It's it's interesting because I I'm, I'm now I will call myself a filmmaker, but it's very it's still very hard for me to do that. Leslie was someone just like Sava, you're a filmmaker, you've made films. Um, but when I started, the, at least the first three, I did not have any experience with this. But I did have like project management experience from before, which I kind of drew on a lot. Which is just like you know, I'm just being really just open to people and being compassionate with people and like communicating very openly as much as possible um and honestly working with really great people like i was able to find really great filmmakers and and writers to work on these on these films and you know take on some of that stuff so find really good people to work with (laughs) um have really open channels of communication that you start out in the beginning being like you know this is a place where we will talk about everything and work through them and and invite conflict and and problems and work through them together do you know what i mean like you know be, be upfront about like expecting that to happen um and and just being just really i don't know just kind um i don't know how else to say it i know it sounds really basic but it's like you know we we didn't have a lot of egos going into this right we were all just like okay we're making this thing we're trying to do the best we can. We're paying as many people as we can. Just like being together in it. Like nobody was just like, even with like Leslie Higman and I, when we were kind of, you know, hashing out some of the stuff and we we're like looking at different um, cuts and trying to kind of figure stuff out and bringing the music together. It's not like we didn't bump up against each other, but we worked through that. And we, at the core knew that we were like, had each other's backs, do you know what I mean? So it was just like having that setting, like a, a, a basis of like honesty and care and then working up from that. And then that makes it much better to do. Like it, it doesn't, you don't, you know, you, you have less likelihood of there being um bad things happening and like tim was saying yeah. like the first writer that i was trying to work with on trust dancing which was not trust dancing, it was something else as i said we did have we did run into problems but we we worked through them to the point where we realized it was better for us to part ways like you know there wasn't any ill will so to speak between anybody right it was like we were still able to kind of be like all right there's stuff happening let's move forward like just like being able to do that um and i think it took me a while to realize that my supervisors also had my back because again you're looking at hierarchies right so if you're in a position like that that you you have other people like you have postdocs or phd students or other people who are working that come below you so to speak in a hierarchy make sure that you're like not playing to that right like make sure that that you the people you're working with don't feel afraid to come to you um and i think you know it was, there were a lot of challenges, but it came together in the end, which I'm still surprised at sometimes. Um, but just, yeah, working with people and being just really op- open and honest about stuff. Yeah, and I think like Sava brought this project to me. And, and so as a production company, I kind of already have structures for making films from doing it for the last um, almost 10 years. So we set out our schedule and we set out our roles and we just gave her and uh and also because of like the way that i prefer to do business and and one of the things that attracted us to working with each other was being upfront with even like emotional check-ins talking about what our communication styles are when we first started out because filmmaking is all encompassing sometimes when you're trying to nail down a location and you're trying to get actors and you're trying to do auditions and sometimes and in your working hours you know setting up with what, what your boundaries are and what your expectations are like our director working full was working full time but is a fantastic director um and was able to take time off work to to work on this project um but sometimes you know you're receiving text messages late at night and like is that okay and just making sure that that was really clear early on um and yeah checking in and and again like we had a lot we had a lot of boxes to check in terms of like safety. Um, uh, you know, we were having people checked for COVID every day on set. Um, we were masking. We were 
doing as many things as we could outside and remotely and, and we were working with um, like quote unquote vulnerable people because we we're working with youth um, and yeah it was just trying to be as mindful and um, ethical as possible um, within a business world but then also like filmmaking is quite intimate so uh, just making sure that we were safe and, and accountable. That's all very helpful. I think that, you know, it, it's almost like any collaborative participatory approach needs those multiple layers of care um, and relationship. Um, so it's helpful to think through, uh, even if we're not doing film, let's say, it sounds really applicable um, to others. Um, Mike had a question in the chat. I don't know, Mike, if you wanted to ask this or if you want me to read the chat, I can, we can do either. I'm fine asking. I was... When you start talking about grant funding, it and I know in America it gets, sometimes gets complicated about who has ownership of the material, like if it's the writer with the script and the production company, and like with movies writing for academia, was there, is it like, is it on open source or is it in common uh, or is it, is do you guys all have equal or do you run into problems where you create this because it's grant funded, but it then leaves your control and you don't to have ownerships over it afterwards? I started I started typing my response to you because I wasn't sure if we'd be able to talk about it, but I think um, in this case, co copyright as is like rests with the institution or the research group. So like the Surveillance Studies Center or um, university, like at Queen's University and U Ottawa, they kind of have hold copyright, I guess, is one way to think about it. But it's um, it's it's an open source. It's like Creative Commons, like open um for people to access right um obviously people can't take it and call it their own but um people can access it that way but i guess copyright in that sense like people sign away their rights I, that sounds wrong but <laughs> they kind of sign it to be like they've created it's it's less that they sign away their rights but they work for the a product that belongs to somebody else right so they say i am going to write this or i'm going to act in this or i'm going to give you this piece of music to use for this particular purpose and then it's attached to that thing right um I, leslie can say more about this as well yeah so i guess the copyright right does lie with their funders as it was privately funded um but as a part of their deal it was like to that it would be open and available to, for people to consume free freely so there's not I, I think because of that we can't do certain like distribution deals and licensing but um it was the more intent the intention was for it to just you know be available as a tool for people to use um yeah and uh i in uh, the grants that I tend to do with my company are usually through um, Canada Council or the Arts Council, and the copyright does lie with the artist or director in the end. Um, so, but for this, this is privately funded through these academic institutions. I'd, I'd, I'd like to add that, that this is sadly maybe very standard for writers from a writer's point of view. I, I think 80% of the work I do, I don't know. I do a lot of work for private clients, I do a lot of projects like this, but for industry a lot of the time, or for large organizations, I, I do a lot of work for World Health Organization, for example, um, around speculative stuff. And all of that stuff is, we are paying you for a service and, and, and you are giving us a product. You know, it's kind of, that's how it's framed. Uh, it's different with novels. It's slightly different with short fiction, but they're not always. Most of what I write is short fiction. It's published in a magazine. There's usually some sort of deal where it's like, they have 12 or 24 months exclusivity. And then after that, I get the rights to republish it wherever I want. Um, but like so much of the fiction I've written in the last couple of years, like I say, has been for like private clients. Um, and quite often isn't published in, in public at all. Um, so that stuff, yeah, I get paid for it, it goes away. I never see it again a lot of the time. <laughs> and it's like, I'm trying to actually try to, partly put together an anthology of short fiction because I've since written so much over the last decade. It's a it's a it's a it's a nightmare. It's a real headache. It's just like just yesterday I had a a wonderful sounding student in Germany, uh comp sci student who wanted to uh reprint something critical that I'd written about supply chain stuff years ago, 10 years ago. And she was like, can I reprint this in, in our 
student magazine and I was like absolutely no problem with me I've got zero issue with it but unfortunately you're gonna have to go to the BBC and ask them <laughs> they own it right do you know what I mean and it's it's uh outside of academia it's uh it's a big horrible neoliberal nightmare let's be honest when it comes to owning owning your work I would say also within academia, <laughs> if you write an article, it's the same. You sign away that it's owned by the journal that publishes it. It's not yours. You can use the preprints, that's yours, but the the printed version, right? The published version becomes theirs. The content, I guess, is yours. So it's a very murky <laughs> separation there. Um, and Ty. Um, I wanted to be able to um, have panelists ask each other questions if you had anything or um, those in the, the chat or um, we can't we have time for for a few more questions I don't want to dominate all of our time with our questions <laughs> but I'm noticing the time on on the clock and this conversation is <laughs> already taking us um, toward the end of our time here how <laughs> <laughs> it went so fast <laughs> to any of there was a, there was a question also that that came up um about um this film in in a canadian context and we were wondering if um in terms of what you know around surveillance um data surveillance if let's say this might play out differently in the eu that has many more privacy um protections around data tracing um than perhaps say in a Canadian or US context, or is it similar? I think it's it's a bit of both. Like I, there's um, there's an AI bill that's been knocking around here in Canada that they're trying to kind of, um, a bunch of us I think are going to sign a letter saying that it's not good enough because it tends to, it tends to defer to industry rather than people. Um, and that seems to be the trend across you know the US and Canada certainly and I think the Europe is a little better about holding industry to certain standards but not by much like I think you know a lot of companies still have access to our data in ways that are troubling when you start understanding it um, and how they can access it and stuff like that and I think it gets murkier because for instance, if you're if you're researchers and you have to do ethics, right, and you talk about like where is where are the data centers located where I'm going to be, you know, saving my data or storing my data, and we have to be careful about it. Like the the servers are in Canada or whatever because Canadian laws protect data in particular ways, but it's hard to do that. Um, and you know, in terms of like things, especially in education, and this is what's like upsetting um, to me in many ways, like especially in education, the ways that technology gets applied or used or procured is very, very problematic because there aren't as many kind of um, regulations around what gets used, right? Those, those decisions are made at an institutional level. Um, so for instance, even in universities, right, we use like E-class or Moodle or whatever it is, like we're not involved in that, in that decision-making process, right? There are administrators or there are, there are procure people in procure, procurement, that's a difficult word. Um, and there are companies <laughs> that approach institutions directly, right? And say like, hey, we have this cool new ed tech that you should totally use. You can get all this data about your students by using this thing. And institutions are like, yes, this sounds amazing. It's like, here, we'll give you a discount. And then you in implement implement it. And then the companies are like, all right, so here's all this data we have on your students. Would you like to pay to access this data too? So it's like, you know, all these things get built into those systems in ways that absolutely exclude the people who are actually using this stuff or being impacted by it, right? How often are teachers or students or administrators, like how often are we part of the conversation about like what we should put in place or how it gets used, right? Um, I use eClass for, because I'm forced to, I can, I'm allowed to not use it, but the amount of skill and time and energy that I would require to set something else up outside of this system, I don't have that. I don't get paid enough to do that. I don't get supported to that. I don't have enough time to do that, right? So then you default to using the tools that we are told to use or are, are available to us. And these things, allow an incredible incredible amount of surveillance over students like i was shocked at how much I, I can tell when students are when they get on there how long how much time they've spent on there how many things they've clicked 
where all they've been. And I do not look at any of this, right? The, the first thing I say to students is like, this is what this software allows me to do. This is the extent of surveillance into your life that this thing enables, but I do not look at it because to me, trust between us is more important than this thing, right? Like, I don't care how much time you spend on this thing. Um, so a lot of these technologies aren't vetted in a way that we normally would um, before being implemented in educational settings. And that's kind of what trust dancing is getting to as well, right? There's a, you know, there's like, well, you know, if you want to do well in school, there's this new technology that they're trying. And a lot of startups can go to schools directly and say, hey, we've got this new thing. Do you want to try it out on your students? Like, we let you use it for free as long as we can access certain things, right? And then in, in that scenario, teachers are implicated because they don't, they're not given a choice either. Like Tim was saying, everything feels like it's a choice but is it you know even in this case I do have the choice of not using e-class but the amount of work and effort and stuff that I'd have to put into opting out of it doesn't make it worth my while right all of us are in education or educators we don't have time we don't have support we don't have technological support right so it's just like we're squeezed into positions of making certain choices where we're not allowed to do anything else. And then before we know it, we're in a surveillance state and we're participating in it and we're, we're helping the surveillance state to surveil our students. Um, so it's, it's really, really, I'm sorry, this is for like this late in the evening, this is a really downer conversation, but I think, you know, <laughs> that's some of the things that we're trying to kind of highlight about this. Um, and then the helplessness of it, right? Even I know this about the system, but I don't have any agency or any power within it to actually affect any change. Like once, you know, when I, once I get tenure or whatever, I'll, I'll go knocking on the Dean's door and be like, yo, let's talk about data privacy. But you know, they're not gonna listen to me very much. <laughs> no, and, I, and, and in the film, one thing we noticed is there, you know, that was very robotic with the tech, but then also with the teacher or the counselor who was who was trying to um, support Frankie, but was a cog in the wheel. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I hear that increasingly from teachers that not only do they not have a choice of which tech to use, but they're required to use technology in order for the institution to have the money they spent on it make sense, right? So you have mm -hmm. to have this many minutes on this app um in order for us to you know exactly. have a reason why we bought this thing in the beginning yeah um, and so yeah spend increasingly millions, a problem yeah institutions spend millions of dollars on this technology right um yeah <laughs> it's 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 yeah. upsetting and we really tried to show that with like how like the teacher was very stressed and like and they had like their timer on and that like they were constantly getting bleeps and bloops to activate them to prompt them to do stuff and i really feel for teachers right now out there because yeah i i have also taught at university and it's like the amount of and i have adhd and it's just like the amount of like computer regulation for the teacher to regulate the student is is overwhelming and you're not and i do I do, as a technology focused individual, I do have to really unplug um, because it's, it's, it's everywhere and it's nonstop. And uh, it, it's, it's, I do wonder how effective it is in terms of like actually efficiency and actually managing things because yeah, I remember having to upload a video every week for students and as a video creator, I, I just ended up opting for using a webcam and like having no doing no slides because like they weren't paying me enough to even do to even make the class and so I just left I found that lecture a straight lecture was the fastest way for me to get the information to the students based off of notes and like that's what and then they were going to be making films to submit to me that we would critique but then for me to make a film each week so that they could make a film, it was like, it was beyond the amount of like work I, I had or time I had available to teach. So these, I, I'm hearing too, and um, as Bob is sharing here in the end here um, about these resistances, um, you know, the resistance of I'm not going to, 
well, here comes my four-year-old. So we're getting near our end <laughs> time. Uh, so we're not going to, um, just a moment, I have to finish our call. Um, so for instance, um, I'm not gonna look at the um, data display of my um, students, or I'm going to choose, right? I'm not gonna make the full film. I'm just going to use the webcam. So there's these everyday resistance um, uh, to these pressures. Um, and I'm wondering what other forms of, of resistance, we were talking about this last night, that it seems like there needs to be um, different for, you know, not just individual forms of resistance. Um, that we need to be working at different scales, something. How is it that we, we resist? It's, it's hard to answer that question, right? Cause like the way that, I was gonna say resistance is futile. Um, if there are any Star Trek, people here um but it's it's really hard because the way that the systems are set up is is for high compliance right if you comply then you will be successful through the system be it an educational system or a you know corporate system or whatever it is so it makes it really hard to resist and then when you do opt out or resist you often are left out and i think that's one of the one of the intersect one of the things about intersectionality i think which which i think isn't is a good thread is like the the privilege to opt out right it also become it, it's either a privilege to opt out or then you get left behind so you have to come to a place where it's like i don't need to be the i don't need this so therefore i can opt out or i'm like so rich that i don't need it that i can opt out or i am so poor that I don't have a choice but to opt out, right? And so you, you're, you're usually at either of these extremes and the, and the rest of us have to kind of comply because if I don't use this, then I don't move forward in my profession or in my life or in my career or whatever it is, right? So again, this comes back to the whole thing of choice. We don't have the choice. It's really hard to resist. We can have small ways we resist in which we say, at least if we're honest about what the systems do, like I'm very honest with my students about, everything that they're doing about all the systems that they use um, and give them an op option to not use it in some ways if possible but even that's hard to do right it's like you have to use google now there's no like these things have become infrastructure in ways that make it hard for us to function outside like we we then become outside of society in many ways right mm -hmm. if we if we can't use it false choices all over the place um okay Thanks for dealing with my chaos in the background. Hopefully it was blurred <laughs> out. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I think it's a, we have a couple of questions and I, I think that we can pull these together. So obviously we've enjoyed the film, loved um, and we're intrigued by it. Um, and we're wondering about the different kinds of reception you received across different types of audience. Um, and David added in here about audience, like academic audience, whether in academia, you've seen a different kind of response. Um, than it, perhaps different audiences. I'll speak quickly. Has it been to, what you've hoped for? Yeah, I'll speak quickly to David's question. And then I think, you know, I know that Leslie had like submitted this to various film uh, festivals and other places. So I'll let her talk to that. And then Tim can talk about that as well. I'll say this, like um, as an academic, this, like the four films were basically my scholarly output. Um, I don't have as many like pubs um, the fact that I, I got a job based on this was was surprising, but also heartening that um, the academy is beginning to see different forms of scholarship as scholarship, right? It, it was hard to sell it as such, but I, I had to work hard to be like, look, this stuff is grounded deeply in research and it's doing a thing. And, and this is like within critical digital literacy and what this is helping to achieve. So I spend a lot of time explaining it or making it legible to people for whom this is not usually something they can see as scholarly output or scholarship. Um, and then I'm bringing that to the classes I'm teaching, right? So all of my students are doing creative projects, but I also have them write up about how their creative project is connected to the research or to the readings or to, um, to theory or to stuff that we're doing. And so continuously making those connections, because if they go forward, they're going to have to make that, that case, right? That this is a work of scholarship. So it was 
a bit of a hard sell, but it, it was legible. Fortunately, I'm very, very lucky that people saw this for what it was. And they weren't just looking at like, well, she doesn't have 15 publications. And I was like, yes, but I have four films. And, you know, people could see that. So it's hard to, to have that. But I think the Academy is shifting quite a bit um, in, in what it sees as scholarship. And I, I want to encourage that. I think that's really important because there's different ways to have intellectual conversations, to talk about important, deep, topics right the different ways of doing that so i think like it's happening it's slow moving but it's happening also like things like this have been amazing i've shown the films in so many classes and talked to so many students and it's just been wonderful because it just i love talking to people about these films like i learn things about the films that i haven't thought about after talking to students who watched it so in that sense i think it's been very well received especially as an educational tool so and that was what i wanted so i'm happy people are watching it somewhere learning stuff about surveillance i'm good Oh, I think you're muted, Leslie. Totally muted. I'm like going on again. It's been through the warning. I'm like, oh, man. I, I just pulled up. I'm just pulling up like our festival submission thing because I. Um, so yeah, we submitted to to quite a lot of festivals, but which is normal. It's usually like about ten percent is what you uh, get back, and yeah, we we. We had success. Um, we were in the Alternative Film Festival. Um, we were in the International Activism Film Festival, the China International Conference of Science and Education Producers, um, the Cyber Film Festival, uh, the Future Film Awards, and the Brooklyn Sci-Fi Film Fest, which is great. And then this, I actually got to go in the spring. We went to the um, AI International Film Festival in Park City. So we've had pretty good, I, um, you know, reception. It's a longer short, like a 20 minute short is considered a longer short or a medium format. And so that's, could be not the easiest in terms of film festivals because a lot of folks want them to be like short shorts. Um, so I'm really pleased with how it's been received. And yeah, it's, I think it's, I just think it's such a great project because on so many different levels, if it's just showing like youth and like in communities that are being affected by um, surveillance and like, and, and so much of it, I feel like it's, it's very like whitewash and it's like, this is what technology is like, no, this is not what reality is. And like, and, and Sava did a good job in, in terms of treating that with, with Tim and, and, uh, and her experience, what her experience has been like in academia and in surveillance. Thank you so much. I'm watching our time and uh, I appreciate the time that you've taken with us. Um, you were able to join us. Uh, if there's anything else you'd like to, to add, Tim, I know you didn't get a chance to answer that, but if anybody else wanna add, feel free. Um, and uh, hopefully what, one of our plans is that we are, will be able to share this recording later um, and we'll be sharing some of our takeaways, um, things that we're still thinking about on social media. So we'll make sure that we tag everyone and um, continue this conversation um, across different uh, platforms and uh, as we create more data traces for someone to surveil. <laughs> All right, have a good evening, everyone. Thank you so Thank much. You. Take Thanks care. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Right, see you all. Bye. Take care.